good to be back. Um, it's wonderful to go on a vacation and to be able to take a moment to step and step out and to relax. Um, uh, and that was a wonderful experience for Josh and I. I we didn't just go to South Dakota to where visit my parents, but we went to my aunt and uncle's farm, which is about two and a half hours into the middle of South Dakota. Uh, so no self-service, no Wi-Fi, just family. Um, and I hadn't gotten a chance to be there in about 10 years, so it was really great to be able to go to the farm, the farm as we all call it. It's kind of funny to say that farm country here. Uh, but we went to the farm and got to experience some of those uh, childhood memories, and it was a great way to recharge my batteries. Um, it's also great to be back in my normal bed again. I don't know if any of you are like, when you travel and then like you're sleeping in some other bed, and you're like, I am not in my, you know, adolescence anymore because a different bed now makes my back hurt. <laughs> Things that people, you know, we get so excited to be adults. And then people are like, you don't realize there are also some other things that come with being adults that, anyway. So my question for you is I would like to hear what, where do you go or what do you do as um, uh, a way to recharge or unplug? Go, go to the horse races. Horse races, yes. We have some bedding Baptists that love to, to recharge their batteries at the, the horse races. The beach. The beach, yes. Uh, yeah, the AC seemed to, to work really well today in the sanctuary. It's not always this efficient, but I know that some of us are a little chilled today. Because, and I didn't turn it down, ridiculous, but we don't have Jim Hill here trying to crank it back to 75. So, the... The thermostat wars have, have not perpetuated. But anybody else, how do you recharge? Even if it's not going somewhere or if it's something you do? Yes. I'm just going to sit on our back deck. Sitting on the back deck, that can be enough. Get in a book and sit in the swimming pool and reading. Reading in the swimming pool, that sounds... I read with a Kindle, and so I just feel like that would be a recipe for disaster. <laughs> <laughs> but that sounds very great. It's, it's good to be able to have those ways of being able to recharge our batteries, uh, so to speak, or to, to be filled up again. And for me, the farm was always one of those places. Some of it was this, here's some pictures from my childhood. Um, that's my, little, my older brother on the, the side over here. He would have been five, so that means I would have been three at the time. And he and I are at the top of that hay bale. Um, I don't know, the big pump. <laughs> These are just pictures from the farm. Uh, and that was always a place to recharge for our family. We spent a lot of weekends there. Now, I'm a city kid. I'm well aware of that. My graduating high school class was over 500 people. So I cannot list off everybody I went to school with. Um, but there's something inside of me, and even my brothers, where we identify as having a little bit of a country um, growing up because of how often we spent at the farm, and that that was the place where you spent time with family, you connected. Maybe it's because there was no internet or cell service or cable television. Eventually they got satellite, but that only worked when the weather cooperated, you know. So you had to be together. Um, and it was a different type of glory days for us. So we, we as a family of five kid, five of us, all got to be back at the farm for the first time in probably 10 years together. And it was just a neat experience for us to do. And then Josh getting to experience his first ATV and side-by-side -side ride. So, um, He's still walking. He is still walking. Yes, he's in one piece. And, and um, I do have to say, I want to brag about our corn a little bit. Uh, South Dakota is struggling with rain right now, and so coming home when the corn is taller than me by now, like their corn is like here at the moment. So that was a significant difference to pull up to church and going, wow, it's tall, <laughs> tall. So 
It's important to find those places where we can recharge so that we can go out and do whatever we are called to do. Um, it's almost like a lost and found energy. Like throughout the week or throughout your daily routine, maybe you get drained and eventually you need to do something to gain that back, to recharge again. And today we're going to be diving into a passage of scripture where a different type of lost and found happens um, that looks different than recharging the batteries, but still has some joyful experience to it. We are going to be in 2 Samuel chapter 6. Um, and I, so I invite you to, to turn your Bibles to that place. The text will be on the screen behind me, but I want to prep you for the passage as you may open up your Bibles. This is going to be closer to the front of your Bible than the back. But previously on the story of Israel, two weeks ago we uh, read at the beginning of 2 Samuel that David learned about the death of Saul and Jonathan. And he mourned. And we, we talked about our own grief in that process and the healthiness of dealing with grief that God loves us through that. Since that point, it is like the cross between a soap opera and Game of Thrones in just five chapters, including the, there's no kids in the room, including the removal of body parts, like people's body parts being chopped off and stuff. There's some interesting things if you read the chapters that we skipped over in between two weeks ago and now. But, uh, in the midst of those struggles and arguments, um, David is finally king over Israel. That was not without its disputes and arguments and battles and things, but he is finally recognized as the king over all of Israel. And he starts out his monarchy or kingship with a bang. Like, big success. And that's what we're going to dive into today, uh, is a look at him starting out with a great success and see a little bit about how this story um, impacts us in one way or another. So, we are going to be reading in 2 Samuel chapter 6. I'm going to read two different portions of 6, so verses 1 through 5 and then 12 through 19. Um, there is um, a section of there if you, in between that we're not reading today, you may read that and have some questions. Feel free to give me a call and we can have coffee, we can go run errands and talk about it, we can, I can't do the J, I don't have a phone on me so I can't do the whole J routine, but you know the drill. If you have questions, feel free to contact me, we can talk about it. I may not have answers, but we can wrestle together at least. So, 2 Samuel chapter 6. Once again, David assembled the select warriors of Israel, 30,000 strong. David and all the troops who were with him set out for Bala, which is in Kurnath, Jerem, of Judah, to bring God's chest up from there, the chest that is called by the name of the Lord of heavenly forces, who sits enthroned on the winged creatures. They loaded God's chest on a new cart and carried it from Abinadab's house, which was on the hill. Uzzah and Io, Abinadab's sons, were driving the new cart. Uzzah was beside God's chest, while Io was walking in front of it. Meanwhile, David and the entire house of Israel celebrated in the Lord's presence with all their strength, with songs, zithers, harps, tambourines, rattles, and cymbals. See, bouncing and stuff during worship. <laughs> King David was told, the Lord has blessed Obed-Edom's family and everything he has because of God's chest being there. So David went and brought God's chest from Obed-Edom's house to David's city with celebration. Whenever those bearing the chest advanced six steps, David sacrificed an ox and a fattening calf. David dressed in a linen priestly vest, danced with all his strength before the Lord. This is how David and the entire house of Israel brought the Lord's chest with shouts and triumphs, trumpet blasts. As the Lord's chest entered David's city, Saul's daughter Michael was watching from a window. She saw David, King David, jumping and dancing before the Lord, and she lost 
all respect for him. The Lord's chest was brought in and it put in its place inside the tent that David had pitched for it. Then David entered, offering. Then David offered entirely burnt offerings in the Lord's presence, in addition to well-being sacrifices. When David finished offering the entirely burnt offerings and the well-being sacrifices, he blessed the people in the name of the Lord of heavenly forces. He distributed food among all the people of Israel to the whole crowd, male and female, each receiving a loaf of bread, a date cake, and a raisin cake. Then all the people went back to their homes. Uh, 
a fence around it, and the Ark of the Covenant was in the very center of the, the tent, a special spot where you had to be extremely prepared to go in and enter God's presence. Um, but So it not only was a religious symbol, but it was a political symbol, okay? This thing is moving into Jerusalem. David and his, his group of people are moving it back into Jerusalem to the city of David. Now, what, there isn't clear scripture, um, scripture leads hints but doesn't explain, is that the Ark of the Covenant until this point was missing for a while. And the reason we learn that is because David wrote a psalm about it. So if you uh, advance forward, I think, I have, to, I have to remember what order my slides are in. So 1 Samuel 5 is where the Philistines had the Ark and the Israelites got it back. And it came, showed up on with the bulls. Okay? And then Psalm 132, David writes the psalm about having to find the Ark. Like they have to go out on expeditions and look for it. So the, the, our text for today just is like, oh yeah, they went to that place. That town that's hard to pronounce, they went to that place, and then they brought it back. Like it was some easy thing. But for a while, it was misplaced. Oops, we don't know where God is. Yeah. But, so, that there's something really big about David bringing the ark into Jerusalem. Something that's like, okay, I have a really lame analogy, all right? And just like all analogies, they're not perfect, and if you push them too far, they usually fall apart, right? So, let's, let's take this from an American mindset. Imagine somebody stole the Declaration of Independence. Not like a national treasure, like you're going to find a treasure trove thing, but... Imagine they stole the Declaration of Independence. It's our symbol of freedom, right? And then the president rallies out a group of people. Okay, your favorite president, okay? Maybe that will make it more relevant. But your, your favorite president picks up the rallies the troops, and they find it and bring it back, and everybody parades it in, and they're like, woohoo, freedom is back. I mean, we still had our freedom, but losing the freedom. Symbolism. It's just a symbol. But woohoo! God didn't really disappear. It's just the, the ark was not around for a while. And ha imagine how much of a celebration we would have in D.C. Mm -hmm. if the uh, Declaration of Independence was missing and then all of a sudden it came back. We would have parades and fireworks and tailgating, you know, cookouts. Because what's a party without food? But this was a big deal. The, what, the reason this analogy fails us is because we don't really have a thing that is also religious and political to like point to as a modern day example, you know, that is important to us in our faith as much as it is um, in our country. And the ark was a mixture thing. David brings this back and is so excited that every six steps the cart takes to bring it back, they sacrifice animals. That's, like as we're thinking about 4-H, like, that's a lot of meat. <laughs> that's, that's a lot of meat. But they're sacrificing animals every six steps that it takes because of the importance of this coming back to Jerusalem. And in the midst of that, the, we see that celebration happen in the midst of that. David is dancing, and music is happening, and he's leaping and singing. And depending on your translation, uh, some of them make it sound like he was wearing his undies. <laughs> like dancing in the street in his undies. Because he was so excited. Now, wives, how would you feel about your husband doing that? You know, I kind of understand why his wife was like, oh my goodness. Like, David, put your clothes 
comes on. Like there, people can see you right now. <laughs> but he's dancing and celebrating. And, he, and if you keep reading in that passage, he responds to Michael and says, no, no, no. I will become more undignified than this for God's glory. That the celebration needed to be big. It needed to be loud and big and um, pinpoint the significance of the moment. Now, this is the beginning of David's kingship. As we keep going in our story, we're going to see that David's successes become fewer and fewer as he keeps moving forward. Some of his, his decision-making skills are not as good as they were at the beginning. But at the beginning, every step he takes, he prays for God's guidance, he listens for God's direction, and points back and celebrates God for any successes he has. So we'll stick to the present for a moment. If you're wanting to read along with this, at one point, at the very beginning, we had a list of um, the scriptures we were going to go through. So we're in 2 Samuel today. This is how far we've gone. Next week is 2 Samuel 7. So we've got a few more weeks left. But if you're wanting to read the in-between parts, maybe not the best bed bedtime story if um, you have a sensitive stomach. Just, just a hint. There's war described. In some of these passages, so if you if you're like me and have a sensitive stomach, just don't do don't do it right before bed. Yeah, <clears throat> but uh, we'll be continuing on with David's story, and we'll still see him as a faithful king for a couple more weeks. But that's not a forever thing. But in this moment, we're just going to stick to his success in the moment. The ark is returning, and in every step of the way, he's praising God to the biggest level possible. To the point where he's embarrassed one of his seven wives. Um, um, like, whoa, I can't believe my husband is doing that. Like, oh, this is embarrassing. And it made me think about, you know, two weeks ago we talked about grief and this, you know, that sometimes we um, use different coping mechanisms for grief. And, you know, I thought about it and I was like, you know, sometimes when I'm sad, I want a cupcake. What do I do when I want to celebrate? Let's go get ice cream or a cupcake. Why am I grief and my joy? Sometimes, sometimes the ways I deal with both of those are similar, but I wanted to ask you, what are some ways that you celebrate? What are some ways, so we talked about what are the ways you recharge, what are some ways you celebrate? Um, any, anything, big or small, what are ways you celebrate? Get with friends. Get with friends. Parades. Parades. Food. Food. Oh yes, one after my own heart. Did you actually go to the, the horse horse track to celebrate, or did sometimes that lead you to? <coughs> sometimes it's depressing. <laughs> <laughs> sometimes we want to be with family to celebrate. Sometimes we want to be with friends. Sometimes we have a special food or beverage that, that is associated with celebrations. When we were little, my parents would take us to Dairy Queen to get ice cream cones when we got good grades. That was our, like, woohoo, you did it! We got an ice cream cone. Uh, but we have all of our ways to celebrate. And it made me think about how David pointed everything back to God. That his celebration was wrapped up in praise to God. And now sometimes, if I'm honest with you, I might be a little bit lacking in the gratitude department. Sometimes I may forget to turn around and thank God for God being part of the process. I know that God equips us and calls us into things, and so some of it is that he's prepared us for those things, but sometimes I forget to stop and say, thanks God for the big or the little things, and everything in between. Sometimes I don't feel grateful, and that's why I think that churches frequently have 
practices wrapped into our worship services to, to train our hearts to want to do those things. Sometimes we don't feel like worshiping God and saying, God, you're so great, but we have music and worship in service to remind us that no matter what we're feeling, God still deserves praise. Some churches, they, they say, well, I mean, here we read the Lord's Prayer and uh, do the doxology. Those are also part of those. Even if you're not feeling it, sometimes we practice it to remind ourselves. Some churches do a uh, confession or reciting of the Apostles' Creed as more parts of teaching our hearts even when we're not feeling it. And I think that way about gratitude. Uh, and how sometimes we may not always feel grateful, especially when God answers prayers in a way that we weren't planning on it or weren't expecting, uh, but that praise still is due to God. Have you guys, there's a, there's a video that's floating around on the internet of this little girl who is, the parents had done so good at training her to be grateful for whatever present she receives. And so she opens this package, and it's a banana. And she's like, a banana? This is great! And she like hugs it, and she's just so excited. And I think somebody prepared that little girl's heart to be ready to receive whatever thing somebody gave her. And sometimes we as adults get out of practice. We don't have our mom or our grandma or somebody else teaching us to say, remember to say thank you, you know? And sometimes we don't even remember to say that to God. So I want us to have a little bit of practice together. To have a moment of gratitude expressed, and maybe this is something you can Take home and do yourselves. But first what I'm going to do is read the very last psalm. So Psalm 150. Um, and it, you'll notice that it seems to fit with what we're doing. But the text will be on the screen behind me. It's, I'm going to read this psalm and then we're going to have a little gratitude exercise. Okay? <clears throat> Praise the Lord. Praise God in his sanctuary. Praise God in his fortress, the sky. Praise God in his mighty acts. Praise God as it suits his incredible greatness. Praise God with a blast of the ram's horn. Praise God with lute and lyre. Praise God with drum and dance. Praise God with strings and pipe. Praise God with loud cymbals. Praise God with clashing cymbals. Let everything Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. I love that this is the last psalm. Because if you read all 150 psalms, um, you'll, you'll see that there's a whole spectrum of human emotion there. There's sadness, there's jealousy, there's fear, there's joy, uh, there's anticipation, all covered in that. And at the very end, it seems like this conclusion. That no matter what is going on in our world, what is going on in our lives or in our hearts, let all of it point back to praising God. Uh, and sometimes that's not easy, but we're going to do a little practice together today and try that out. So here's what's going to happen. I'm going to give you a few seconds, maybe only five, to think of something you're grateful for. Um, you're just going to get a second to think about that. And then, on the count of three, we're all going to shout, thank you. This will be really awkward if I'm the only one who shouts. <laughs> okay. All right. So at least somebody join with me. But, so we're going to take a second and think of that thing that you're grateful for. One little thing, maybe it's you had a great breakfast this morning. Or maybe it was a big thing, like the life you've been given, the family you have. And on the count of three, we're going to say thank you. One, two, three. Thank you! I know it seems a little cheesy. Until we train our hearts 
to see the big and the little things for the joy that they are. Now, if I'm honest with you, as a 30-something who grew up with cell phones and internet, going to the farm doesn't always seem like something to be grateful for because how do I keep in contact with people? What if they need me? You know? But I found joy, and it was something little that ended up being something big to be grateful for. A time to plug in with family, a time to be recharged, and to be able to go and do more service. So I encourage you to find your own way to practice gratitude. Maybe you have to do some audible thank yous throughout your week when you notice the beauty and the blessings. Maybe you make yourself a gratitude jar where you write things down and tuck them into the jar for yourself and you can review them later. Or maybe you set family time 